Well, thank you <clears throat> and good afternoon. If you are a coach and you're sitting in this room, you are probably one of the most successful coaches in your country. And I commend you for that. And it's an honor for me to get the opportunity to speak with you today. My goal is to give you some information that will help you be even more successful. Well, here's a view that we've all seen many times. Typical training uh, for a team. And I began my career as a swim coach. For about 10 years, I had the opportunity to work with raw beginners on a summer team, uh, all levels of age group swimmers, national and international caliber swimmers on a university team. But then I decided I wanted to specialize, and now I spend a lot more time looking at an image something like this. This is the hand force for one stroke cycle for a swimmer. The green arrow shows where the swimmer starts generating force on the water. The red arrow shows where they stop generating force. And what's really important are the, is the way that the force fluctuates within the stroke cycle, because that gives us a lot of information about technique. Now we can compare this to a biomechanical model where this swimmer is positioning the arm in a stronger and stronger position all the way through the stroke cycle, increases the hand force throughout the stroke cycle, and consequently has a nice, smooth, steady increase in force. Okay, well, with that in introduction to force analysis, let's play guess who's the Olympian. So I'm going to show you the force cur curves for four swimmers, and you can pick out who you think the Olympian is. The force curves in black are for the left hand, the force curves in outline are for the right hand. So here's the first two. Number three. And, num and number four. And now let's look at all four of them together. And as you evaluate these force curves, you can think about the biomechanical model that I showed you and see if the swimmer's increasing their hand force nice and smooth and steadily throughout the stroke cycle. You can look at the peak force. You can look at the consistency from stroke to stroke. You can look at the symmetry between the left hand and right hand. Those are all reasonable ways to evaluate a swimmer's hand force. These force values are in pounds, and we have the same scale for all four swimmers. So, would you please raise your hand if you think the Olympian is number one? How about number two? Number three? Okay, a couple votes for number three. Number four? Okay, a lot of votes for number four. And would you please raise your hand if you haven't raised your hand yet? Oh, nobody, nobody, okay, everybody made a guess then. Well, <clears throat> although number four has a really nice, smooth, steady increase in force, I can understand why you would, would pick that one, the Olympian's actually number two. And she's not just any Olympian, but she won a gold medal. Well, when I captured this data, uh, the coach of the team that I was working with came up to me and he says, what do you think of our Olympian? Ooh. <laughs> um, now, any swimmer, I can pick out positive technique elements. But as you can see, there are fluctuations that show force losses and limiting factors. And that's the case with any swimmer. So just because a swimmer is an Olympian doesn't mean that they have 
a perfect technique. Very often, a swimmer will excel because they are very strong, they're very well conditioned, but their technique may not be optimal. For example, where a swimmer can generate 50 pounds of peak force and be very competitive with that, I've tested swimmers who can generate 80 pounds of force. Uh, as far as the maximum oxygen uptake, you can be really competitive if you have a value of 60 or 70, but I think there's swimmers over 90. So if you are really strong, you're really well conditioned, your physiology is such that you are exceptional in those categories, your technique could be average and you can still perform at a very high level. A group of Olympians that I tested, and, and with the, uh, the technique, the, the, the drag coefficient here is for freestyle. I tested a group of Olympians, and they had an average value for their drag coefficient of 0.9. So they're better than average, but again, nothing exceptional. There are swimmers with drag coefficients below 0.6. So I give you this information uh, so that maybe you will question the value of just modeling an Olympian without additional information. But let's look at this another way. Let's just watch the very beginning of this swimmer's breaststroke pull. Now he's an Olympian. He was also a USA national champion. If you only saw this much of his stroke, you might think that it makes sense to replicate that technique, to have the rest of your swimmers do it. How bad could it be if somebody is a national champion and an Olympian? When we add force data, to the video. We look at the same motion. We can see that as he makes this arm motion, he actually loses force. And this is consistent with what we know about biomechanics. He's not taking advantage of flexing his elbows. And it's absolutely essential to flex your elbows to get your arms in a, a stronger position to generate force. Hand force is directly related to swimming velocity. So the better job you can do increasing your hand force throughout the stroke cycle, the faster you're going to go. And having a, hand, a loss in hand force is a very definite technique limitation. So maybe you'll question the value of modeling an Olympian. And I don't have time to show you a lot of examples, but maybe that one example shows you that it is really important to quantify technique, not just have a video analysis. But if you wouldn't model a, a, an Olympian, what about a superhuman? You might model a superhuman, right? Has anybody heard of the TV show called Stan Lee's Superhumans? Anybody see that? You know, we have it in the USA. Stan Lee is a comic book guy. He created Spider-Man and uh, the, the Fantastic Four. Uh, but he's got a TV show, and on the TV show, he features superhumans. So he was doing a, 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 one of the shows on superhuman strongmen. One of the strongmen swims towing ships, like barges and ferries. So they wanted to do this show, and they wanted to find out just how strong he was. So they asked me to analyze him. 
So I analyzed this, this superhuman strong man, and I found out that his peak force was about 30 pounds. Now, if you remember back to the females that I showed you, they all had a peak force of about 30 pounds. So I went to the producer and I said, your superhuman strong man can generate as much force as a girl. This relegated me to a very minor role in that TV show. I think they ended up giving me about 10 seconds of air time in the hour-long show. But our culture says, swim like a fast swimmer. And you can fill in the name of any Olympian, but you can also fill in the name of somebody in a swimmer's peer group. <clears throat> when my daughter was eight years old, the fastest swimmer in her age group was Carla. So we're at a swim meet, and before my daughter's first event, she goes to talk to her coach, and her coach says, swim like Carla. Understandable that a coach would say that. Carla was really fast. Carla did not have exceptional technique. She was certainly not the model. But that's what our culture says. Look at the Olympian, let's do what the Olympian's doing. And very often without any science to, to support it. Instead, we can apply physics. We can quantify technique. And then we can have a much better idea of how certain we are that a technique adjustment is going to pay off in faster swimming. <clears throat> now that's a, 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 an introduction to what I'm going to get into as far as how we can use science and innovation in keeping in line with the theme of this conference, how we can use that information to uh, speed up the skill learning process, and also prevent shoulder injuries. If you haven't ever looked at the inside of somebody's shoulder, there's a bone in the upper arm, there's a bone in the shoulder, and in between the two, there is soft tissue. When the upper arm is elevated, the space between the upper arm and the shoulder is compressed. And that can irritate the soft tissue in between. You may have heard of shoulder impingement. In fact, I'd be surprised if anybody in this room hasn't heard of shoulder impingement. You elevate your upper arm a few times, that's not a problem. Lots of swimmers have their arm in a, in a position that reduces the space between those bones maybe a million times in a year. And with that kind of repetition, that can seriously uh, stress the shoulder and cause injury. <clears throat> a study was done at Brazilian Nationals and 50% of the swimmers there had shoulder problems. Scott Rodeo was the team physician for the USA uh, team in 2008. He surveyed the team and found that two-thirds of them had had shoulder injuries. McMasters and Troop, they, they say 80% experience shoulder pain. And a recent posting on the, clinic, on the Cleveland Clinic website also shows that a very high proportion of swimmers have shoulder injuries. This is a real serious problem. Here's something that stresses the shoulder. 
When a swimmer completes the arm entry, usually the hands are just below the surface. But the shoulders are usually a little bit deeper. Now, there's no arm entry that's going to eliminate shoulder stress. But the deeper the shoulders submerge, the more shoulder stress a swimmer is going to have. And unfortunately, there are a lot of swimmers who submerge their head and shoulders a great deal so that they really put a tremendous amount of stress on their shoulders. And this is a university swimmer. The stress on the shoulder is compounded when the swimmer flexes at the neck and then also internally rotates the arms. And while this position is extreme, it's not unusual. This swimmer has her neck flexed even more, her arms internally rotated so that the thumbs are pointing down. And I feel her pain. I'm not sure that there's anything that she could do to put more stress on her shoulders. And here's the real kicker. She's nine years old. Now, I'm going to come back to her, talk about her a little bit later. Before, first, let me show you how we get force information on swimmers. We strap a cable to the back of the swimmer. Then we put sensors on each hand. The sensors measure the difference in pressure between the palm of the hand and the back of the hand. And from that information, we can calculate the hand force. Once the swimmer's got the sensors on, we have a camera underwater at the end of the pool. Then the swimmer swims towards the camera. And we capture data over the course of a, of a uh, 10 meter swim. That ends up being plenty of information. So now if we look at the position that that swimmer has, has put considerable stress on her shoulders, we can also match that up with how much force she's generating. And as she begins to move her arms, not only does she maintain her hands above her shoulders in a stressful position, but she also generates very little force. And it's not until over three-tenths of a second before her hands drop below the level of her shoulders, she flexes her elbows, and the force begins to increase. Now here's a swimmer, an Olympian, with a less stressful arm entry. His hands are about the same level as his shoulders. As he begins his pull, <clears throat> his hands move sideways. He does not flex his elbows. And because he keeps his hands above his shoulders, his arms are in a stressful position for a quarter of a second. He also generates very little force because his arms are in a weak position. Here's another Olympian. Very, very common for a swimmer to begin the, the butterfly pull by moving the arms sideways. Very little force and stress on the shoulders during that entire time. We looked at a group of 20 university butterflyers and th this is the, the length of the average stroke cycle, about 8 tenths of a second. But it took the swimmers 
over three tenths of a second before they submerge their hands below the level of the shoulders. During that time, they're generating very little force, so it's hurting their performance, but it's also really hurting their shoulders. And th that three-tenths of a second ends up being 43% of the stroke cycle, which is essentially wasted. So for a swimmer to make an effective arm entry, it's essential that the elbows are maintained above the hands, and then to have a downward angle of the hands as the arm entry is, is performed. So that when the arm entry is completed, the hands are deeper than the elbows, the elbows are deeper than the shoulders. This position not only puts less stress on the shoulders, but now it's all, the, the swimmer is also in position where she can immediately begin to generate a lot of force by flexing the elbows. So that was a model, a biomechanical model. Real easy to get her to uh, make the kind of arm motions that I want to present. But here's a real human. Notice that she's got a downward angle on the arm entry. Her hands are submerged below the level of her shoulders already. As she completes the arm entry, her hands are a little bit below her shoulders, and now she's in position where she can flex her elbows and immediately have a considerable increase in force. And this time the force values are in Newtons. So a drill that I use to work on this is to have swimmers push off from the wall on the surface in a position like this, and then while keeping the head, the torso, and the legs completely motionless, to move the arms through the butterfly stroke, and then to lift the elbows so that the elbows will be higher than the hands, then maintain the elbows higher than the hands so that the swimmer can get the idea of the downward angle on the arm entry. If no other body parts are moving, it's much easier for a swimmer to understand how to control their arms and have a less stressful entry. For this drill, it's really important to limit how many repetitions they do, uh, especially when you initially start doing a drill like this. Uh, if a swimmer only does three arm motions, they can do it without breathing. So there's no reason for there to be any head, body, or leg motion. If only the arms are moving, the swimmer will have a much better idea of what they're doing with their arms. When the arms enter the water, if the swimmer's looking at the arms, then they can be sure that they've got a downward angle. And as soon as the arms straighten, the hands need to be the deepest part of the arm. The hand needs to be below the elbows, the elbows below the shoulder. And I find myself always reminding swimmers to not to try to swim butterfly because as soon as they try to do something that's natural, it defeats the whole purpose of the drill. They will, do, they will not do 
as good a job controlling their arms if they're trying to add what they consider to be a natural butterfly rhythm. Well, back to this swimmer. Last year she came to me in March, and the yellow line shows you where the surface of the water is located. Now, we worked on that drill, and when she came back in June, she was doing much better as far as the orientation of her hands and her shoulders. When she was completing the arm entry, the hands were the deepest part of the arms. Her head was still pretty far below the surface, so there's not much of a change in that. But then when she came back in December, she was even doing a better job controlling the head position. And then she was able to resume training. But she was out of training for a considerable amount of time. Nine-year-olds generally don't suffer shoulder injuries, particularly not as severe as that girl. But they are very common. And the study was done a couple years ago. There were about 500 swimmers in this study. The yellow bars show the shoulder injuries. The, other, the, the green bars show the injuries from everything else. So until a swimmer gets to university age, there's, it's about even, shoulder injuries and then everything else. But once a swimmer gets into a university, the, the shoulder injuries are the most common by far. And wh what this means is that if a swimmer makes it to university, that they have a better than 50-50 chance of having a shoulder injury. So this is really a really serious problem that uh, needs to be addressed, and as you can see, even as early as age nine. Lots of swimmers get injured because of butterfly, but even more get injured because of freestyle. Here's a typical freestyle arm entry. This is a USA uh, age, national age group record holder. Very typical in that she's completed her arm entry and her hand is a little bit closer to the surface than the shoulder, similar to what we saw with butterfly. And we conducted a study on this. Ted Becker and I have collaborated for many years. He's a former head trainer of the USA Olympic swim team. Uh, and we, we saw that the swimmers were generally completing the arm entry with the hand above the shoulders. Uh, a, a fair percentage of the swimmers completed the arm entry with the hand about the same level as the shoulders, but it was pretty rare for a swimmer to complete the arm entry with the hand deeper than the shoulders. When we looked at the difference between females and males, we found that the females were generally completing the arm entry with the hand above the shoulder. The males were usually completing the arm entry with the hand at the same level as the shoulder. And we did a, a study where the difference is very dramatic. And, and, and as I said, it's pretty rare for a swimmer to complete the arm entry with the hand below the shoulder where there is less stress on the shoulder. So here's the typical female arm entry. Here's the typical male arm entry. And here's an effective arm entry. And the difference between where a swimmer normally completes the arm entry and when they get their arm in position 
where there's less stress on the shoulder and where they can start to generate a substantial amount of force, that, is, that exposure time to stress is um, something we can quantify. So here for freestyle, we again see a swimmer with her hands way above her shoulder, and it takes her two-tenths of a second before her hand submerges below the level of the shoulder. During that time, she's stressing her shoulder. During that time, she's generating very little force. And you can see once she gets to this position, that force is going to increase considerably. Ha getting the hand below the shoulder, flexing the elbow, that's what increases the hand force. And when we look at the difference in the exposure time to shoulder stress for males and females, uh, over a quarter of a second, females, university level females, are generally wasting about a quarter of a second. The males, not as bad off, but a tenth of a second. It's a tenth of a second of every stroke cycle that they are not productive. And think about what proportion of a stroke cycle that is. That's an awful lot of time for a swimmer to waste. So this is an area of technique that can have tremendous impact on performance in addition to saving a lot of shoulders, keeping a lot more swimmers involved in the sport. So for an effective freestyle arm entry, once again, the elbow needs to be above the hand as the arm enters the water with a downward angle so that when the arm entry is completed, the hand is the deepest part of the arm. And with this head position, the swimmer can see this. If they complete the arm entry with the hand in a higher position, the hand will not be within the view. And then the swimmer can immediately begin the pull in this position. So it's really a bonus in many respects. <clears throat> Less shoulder stress, though, and being able to generate force more quickly uh, are, are two big uh, advantages. To practice this, I don't recommend any uh, conventional type of drill simply to have the swimmer swim a short distance where they don't have to breathe. And that needs to be modified for the age and ability level. But if it's a really short distance, they don't have to breathe, which means they don't have to move their head. If they're going at a nice slow stroke rate, they're not going to get fatigued. They can focus better on what they're doing. And really, important that they watch the arm entry on every stroke cycle. And I can't tell you how many swimmers I've asked them what they see when they're swimming. The most common answer I get is, I don't know. The second most common answer I get is nothing. If swimmers learn to take advantage of what they can see while they're swimming, there's a much better chance that they can control what they're doing. So if a swimmer's got an effective arm entry, if he's got a downward angle and completes the arm entry with the hand as the deepest part of the arm, not only can that arm begin generating force right away, 
But then there's also a better overlap. When the entry arm completes the entry, that arm can start generating force before the other arm has completed uh, generating force. And that will mean a more consistent, a more continuous application of force so that the swimmer will have a more constant body velocity and will use energy more efficiently. So back to a traditional team practice. And think about what's normally going on in this practice, that most of the time the swimmer is swimming laps. So let's call that traditional training. Deliberate practice is a concept developed by Anders Ericsson. And Ericsson is a psychologist at Florida State University. And he's really gotten to the status of rock star in the psychology world, and even, even broader than that. You may have read some books that uh, explain deliberate practice concepts. But he's determined the important factors of practice that have to be included if you want to be an expert in any field. It doesn't matter if you're going to play a violin, if you're going to perform surgery, if you're going to lead the military. If you want to be an expert, there are certain strategies that have to be included in your practice. Now, I'm going to talk about deliberate practice more in just a minute. Oh, I, I do want to mention that um, I, I've got a study that I'm collaborating with, with Erickson on. Uh, and we hope to have results at the beginning of next year. I just need to take a minute to mention an article that was just published in Swimming in Australia. Coach Hiddlestone explained how there are great benefits to having a system for skill learning. I don't have time to talk about systematizing skill learning. That's, that's a, a couple days worth of lectures, not, not one hour. Uh, but I, I encourage you to get a copy of that article, because Coach Hiddlestone did, has done a really good job of explaining how there are so many benefits to a program. And coaches probably benefit as much as anybody by having a system. So I'm only going to touch on systematizing skill learning a little bit. Uh, I, I do want to get back to, to deliberate practice. But why is deliberate practice necessary? How come, how come traditional practice isn't good enough? Because certainly it, it, it's produced a lot of really fast swimmers. But here's an observation by one of the Canadian coaches of the 30 swimmers that they had at the last Olympics. He said the 10 couldn't streamline properly. One third of an Olympic team hadn't mastered the most basic skill that we have in competitive swimming. Well, if we, if we take a deliberate practice approach where we make very clear instructions, where we specify the orientation of body parts from the hands all the way down to the feet and give swimmers cues like having one hand on top of the other, making the arms straight, locking the elbows, squeezing the ears with the upper arms, looking down at the bottom of the pool directly beneath the head, making the legs straight, making the toes pointed, keeping the feet together. 
If all of those cues are given to a swimmer, there's a much better chance that the instructions will be clear enough that a swimmer can get into uh, a perfect streamline. Well, I went through these cues at a, a previous conference, and John Heil, who's a sports psychologist, he was there, and he said, Rod, why don't you just tell swimmers to make a triangle with their upper arms, with their arms, and then make a triangle with their legs? And I said, great idea, John. And doesn't that really show how streamlined a human body can get? You know, if you're complying with all the cues for an effective streamline, the triangles really drive home the point of how you can minimize resistance. But having clear instructions, that is one of the uh, characteristics of deliberate practice that Erickson came up with that's, that has to be included in uh, a program that will uh, help someone progress to expert level. And just to get back to how there is a very little bit of the stroke cycle that a swimmer can actually see. But whatever body parts are within that visual range, it's really important for a swimmer to take advantage of that. Humans do much better with what we can see than what we can feel. And unfortunately, we have to feel the whole rest of the stroke cycle. We have to use kinesthetic cues for the majority of each stroke cycle. So the little bit that we can see, we need to take advantage of. Task difficulty needs to be appropriate. Well, I hear a lot of people saying how, how much they would like to have a 50-meter pool. And certainly that's important. If you're going to compete at the international level, you do need a 50-meter pool. There is an awful lot that can be gained by training with a much shorter pool, a much smaller pool. There are a lot of swimmers that can benefit from swimming in a backyard pool, a motel pool, where it's a seven, eight meter stretch. And in fact, even the width, if it's only five meters, the youngest swimmers can push off and do two or three or four strokes. They don't have to breathe, means they don't have to move their head, means they can focus much better on what they're doing. Back to the butterfly arm drill to make another point about appropriate task difficulty. In addition to working on the arm entry, far more uh, precise control can be added to this drill, such as working on the arm motion, the exact path of the hands all the way through the stroke cycle. If the head body and legs are not moving, it's much easier for the swimmer to be certain what they're doing with their arms. The swimmer needs to make a sufficient number of repetitions. And first of all, the practice uh, environment needs to be such that a swimmer can perform enough repetitions so that they are certain they're controlling their technique. But beyond that, then they need enough repetitions to make the adjustment permanent. And that amounts to many, many thousands of repetitions. So having some work on technique for a certain amount of time will help a swimmer 
begin to control a technique adjustment. But if they just return to a traditional workout where the coach is trying to get them to swim fast and get tired, they won't get in enough practice repetitions to make the technique changes permanent. Now, feedback is something that can be done uh, in a variety of ways. Individual feedback is, of course, essential. Uh, there's a lot of times, though, when a whole group of swimmers is either complying with the coach's instructions or the whole group is not complying with the coach's instructions. Either way, this is an opportunity for a coach to give feedback. Certainly, the positive technique elements need to be reinforced. And certainly, the limiting factors need to be addressed as well. But back to just making, uh, uh, mentioning a little bit about systematizing skill learning. Because this is uh, an involved process. It does take a lot of time, but the benefits are great. And it can really help coordinate the efforts of a coaching staff if the technique uh, feedback instruction is all systematized. And then here's one other factor that was mentioned in Hiddlestone's article about offering skill competitions. One exercise that I typically use at, with my clinics and camps is to ask swimmers to swim a length of, butter, of breaststroke and instruct them that they can glide in the streamlined position every time they want for as long as they want. And to count how many strokes it takes them to get across the pool. There's no time component to this exercise. Uh, they have to swim legally. They can do an underwater pull and kick. But then once they get to the surface, they count how many strokes it takes them to get across the pool. Well, when I do this exercise, and a 16-year-old boy is taking four or five strokes to get across the pool, but 13-year-old girls are taking two strokes to get across the pool, it gets his attention. The International Swim Coaches Association is planning to offer skill competitions at one of their upcoming meets, I think in the spring. If this is not an organization that you're familiar with, uh, I, I would take a look at what they're doing, because this organization is, is very progressive in that manner. They're going to offer a swim meet that has the typical kind of events that you would get at any swim meet, but then they are also going to offer skill competitions, where the focus is on the effectiveness of the technique as opposed to how fast somebody goes. Uh, <clears throat> and based on Hiddlestone's art article, uh, I, I think probably things will change some in Australia as well. Individualized supervision and is, is uh, key to practicing deliberately. And I, I know how difficult this can be for some workout situations. Some of you may be coaching 30 or 40 swimmers in a group. And working with each swimmer individually can be a real challenge. It's essential, but I, I understand what you can often be up against. 
Brent Rushall has a system of training called Ultra Short Race Pace Training, USRPT. Anybody using that? Okay, some. And <clears throat> the, one of the advantages to this, because the, 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 the swimmers are training at a very fast speed, the, a very high intensity, but they're swimming very short distances. And the emphasis of this program is, is not on training distance, but it's on, um, so that it leaves a lot of time for skill instruction. So this is, this is one way of uh, training swimmers where you can free up more time for individualized instruction. Uh, there, there's more time for skill work, and then also with this type of a program, as you make the progression from maintaining technique at a slow speed, you've got the time to work in exercises where a swimmer can gradually increase their stroke rate and get closer to race pace with maintaining the technique. A variety of learning strategies is important. And now, for all of these, these factors of deliberate practice, I'm, I'm really just giving you one or two examples. Uh, there are many more. Uh, but the, the quantitative information that can be provided to swimmers is, is really important uh, if you not only show where there's a limitation in the technique where the arms are straight and the hands are above the shoulders, but then you can also point out the positive technique elements where elbow flexion produces a very quick increase in hand force. The, the uh, cognitive and associative learning stages are the first two stages of skill learning. The autonomous stage is the third stage. And this one's really the easiest to explain because I'm sure everybody in this room can set the program in their head for butterfly, push off from the wall, get to the other end of the pool, having swum, a perfectly legal butterfly and not really having thought about it at all. That's the autonomous stage. That's where it's automatic. And it's kind of nice to, to get to that stage if you want to instead think about, you know, sing a song or something while you're swimming instead of focusing on your technique. Unfortunately, the autonomous stage is absolutely the worst thing to do if you want to control your technique. You need to stay in the cognitive and associative stages. Focusing on cues, as I explained earlier, that's a way to keep a swimmer from getting into that autonomous stage. If they're continually monitoring the cues that you give them, if, if they have specific information that they have to see and feel on every single stroke cycle, there's a much better chance that they will uh, stay out of the autonomous stage and uh, get in a sufficient number of repetitions so that they can make a technique change permanent. And then, of course, replicating superior performance is um, another of Erickson's deliberate practice strategies. And think about when, when you've seen a swimmer in a race, and they, they look maybe completely different than anything you've seen on the first 25 of a 100-meter of a swim. I know I've, I've seen that. 
and in fact, I, wasn't, I, I had, would have to ask an assistant coach who it was, because it looked like something I had never seen before. Uh, but unfortunately, the swimmer's not always replicating the best technique that they can do all the time. You know, when there's an emphasis on training distance, when a swimmer starts to fatigue, if they're, start, starting to, if they're trying to swim too fast before a technique element has become permanent, then the technique will deteriorate. They won't exhibit that, rep, that, that superior performance all the time. You know, think about an, an, another field. You know, think about playing an instrument. If a music teacher heard a note that was off, would they let the student keep playing? You know, chances are they would stop them, get them back on track. So, some numbers about traditional and, and deliberate practice. <clears throat> Here's a study where we had eight groups. There were 10 swimmers in each group. And you see a pretty big difference from the 9 and 10 age group to the 11 and 12 age group. And think about the swimmers that you've worked with. Haven't you seen very big differences in those ages? That's usually the case. That's when swimmers improve a lot. And you prob your programs probably have a heavy emphasis on technique for those ages. But as they get older, the, the, the technique improvements diminish. And for teenagers, a lot of times teenagers don't improve at all. That's very, very common. Uh, these um, active drag coefficient values are for freestyle. And if, if you're not familiar with active drag coefficient, it, it's the best overall measure of a swimmer's technique. And the lower the value, the more effective the technique. Now, a coach in Hawaii has an Aquanex system, he was able to conduct a study using deliberate practice strategies. And um, th this is one swimmer, a 14-year-old boy, before the pretest, which is the first couple of, of uh, stroke cycles on this side, before the pretest, <clears throat> the 14-year-old boy swam a best time in his 100-meter backstroke. And then for the next week, the coach had the group training in a flume, and they're swimming backstroke, so he had the monitor above their heads, so that in real time they could see each stroke cycle as they performed each stroke. They could see their hand force on each stroke cycle. At the end of the week, this 14-year-old boy was post-tested, and his peak force is about double what it was in the pretest. Now he had just set a best time before the pretest. A week later, after the post test, he went to a swim meet and he dropped his time by four more seconds. He was practicing deliberately. A study conducted with young teenagers, these were 13-year-old teenagers, using the deliberate practice strategies that I went through. Uh, in one week, we saw considerable improvement in technique. Now, the effect size, if, if, if you're not familiar what, a, what effect size is, it's a statistical way of making comparisons more fair. So that's why we, we have fair comparisons among the four strokes by using effect size. An effect size of 0.8 is considered a large effect. An effect size of 0.2 is considered small, but it, it can still be statistically significant. In this case, 
uh, butterfly and the butterfly and backstroke uh, technique improvements were both significant. And this was in one week. A similar study was conducted on 17-year-old swimmers. These swimmers were all members of a national team. And in dealing with swimmers of that level, there's, there's an extra level of complexity because a lot of times when a swimmer gets to that level, and probably a lot of the swimmers you're coaching with, they may not want to change their technique. Well, in spite of that, we still found a pretty big difference. And this was, this was a one-month treatment. The, the fly and breaststroke improvements were statistically significant. So, if we look at, at traditional and deliberate practice in comparison, yes, we see a big improvement for traditional practice from 11, from, uh, 11 and 12 to 13 and 14, but it's, um, that's over a two-year period. In one week, 13-year-olds improved almost as much. The, the young teens of 13 to 14 to 15 to 16, very often swimmers at that age, the, the training program will emphasize training distance and put much less of an emphasis on technique. So these swimmers actually deteriorated in technique. And then the 17-year-old group with one month there was a substantial improvement in their technique as well. So what we see here is that deliberate practice, a short-term treatment of deliberate practice, can have an effect that's comparable to a much longer treatment with traditional training. In uh, way of concluding, um, I hope that I made the point that using science, we have a better chance of developing a model we can be certain about. That, the, um, and, and then also with quantifying technique, with adding numbers to the analysis, that that's absolutely essential also. Swimming has progressed to the point where we are beyond just trying to replicate what an Olympian's doing. We are beyond just looking at a video of a swimmer. We're past that. We need to apply science in the in manner of technique. We need to use the principles of physics. We need to rely on the research. And we need to get measurements on technique to be certain about what's happening. Now, when, when I analyze swimmers, I find a technique limitation. I can tell them how to adjust it, and I am certain that it's going to improve their technique if they make that adjustment. For a coach to be leery about that, cautious about that, I understand that because you never know for certain what's going to happen. If a swimmer makes another change that actually hurts their performance, that is possible. But if they only make the changes that we can identify by using an analysis, we can be very certain that it will improve their performance. And repeated testing will tell us for sure. And then the deliberate practice concepts, those are essential to incorporate into a program to speed up the learning process. And they also are really important in helping a swimmer make the adjustments that's going to minimize shoulder stress. 
Okay, just one more thing. Let's play guess who's the Olympian again. All right, here is the hand path, the freestyle hand path for one swimmer. You have the, the pull phase is the first arrow, the push phase is the second arrow. Okay, so we've got red, we've got white, and we've got blue. So who Uh, white is two-time Olympian, Mark Spitz. And blue is three-time Olympian, Gary Hall. So whoever you guessed, you're right. They're all Olympians. But this, this is just one more example of how Olympians can be extremely successful with a wide variety of techniques. There's pretty dramatic differences in their hand paths. So that's, uh, I will leave you with that. That's, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes? Well, we, <clears throat> Aquanex is designed to, to provide that information, uh, but but you, you need you need a force measurement. You also need the, you need their their velocity, and then then you need the the size of the swimmer, the the cross section that they're pushing through the water. So yeah, unfortunately, active drag measurement is very very complicated. Um, I don't know if Bruce Mason's in here. He, he's done a lot of work with active drag measurement as well. Oh, and, and, uh, and Dave Pendergast. Uh, I, I don't know if they're in here, but they're, they're present at this conference. And I, it's, it's an extremely important area of research and, and also very, very complicated. Yeah, no, there's no easy way to do it. At least not that I've figured out. This, this, with, with Aquanex, though, we get, we get an instantaneous measure, but you do need the equipment to do it. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my question is, on the backstroke, that shoulder stress would also be important if the if the rotation is not the the body rotation is not enough on the backstroke with the shoulder stress. Um, yeah, well, <clears throat> so you, you you can injure your shoulder uh, in in many different ways, and I I didn't mean that the backstroke and breaststroke are immune to shoulder injury. It's just that most swimmers injure themselves with butterfly and freestyle. Sure, oh, you know, backstroke is, is uh, certainly a problem. Thank you. Yes? Uh, wait, can you wait for the microphone? <clears throat> Um, I had a question about when swimmers are told to hold streamline, they uh, bury their head so that it's really deep and our shoulder, our uh, arms are way above our head, so it's nice and tight. Do you think that that could also negatively impact a swimmer's shoulders? I, I just didn't get the very last part of that. 
do you think that could also negatively impact uh, shoulder shoulders? Well, it, it's possible. I, I wouldn't put that at the top of the list as far as stress on the shoulders, but sure, it's possible. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much.